I would like to uh, invite our next speaker, Klaus Hübeck from University of Groningen, who will talk about long-term impacts of COVID-19 on climate targets. So please, Klaus. Hello, thank you very much. I think you, I hope you all hear me okay. Can yes. you confirm? Yes. It's a great pleasure to be here, to meet you all online. Let me start sharing my slides as well. Can you see them? Yes, very good. There you go. So the topic is long-term impacts of COVID-19 on climate targets. My name is Klaus Hubercek. And I think Yuli Shan, who is a co-author, is also here today. And uh, it's a co-authored paper forthcoming in Nature Climate Change soon. So it's the first time we present this. We are both from IRES, the Integrated Research Center on Energy, Environment and Society. Usually I would have come to Bangkok and flown there by plane, stayed in a hotel and created lots of carbon emissions. Now I'm at home creating some carbon emissions using the internet and heating here in the Netherlands. But due to COVID, we have uh, uh, experienced quite some structural changes in the economy and also responses from gov uh, governments. And so my research questions in this paper are, will the economic decline and the associated decline in greenhouse gas emissions, which we have experienced, help us to achieve climate targets. And uh, as, as I mentioned, there were trillions of dollars and euros spent globally uh, to keep the economy afloat. So the second question then is, will the stimulus packages to designed to kickstart the economy actually increase overall emissions? So as you all know, just as a step back, we had a couple of waves already uh, in Europe. We are now in the second wave. The US seems to be in the third wave already. Uh, and uh, we had some waves of lockdown in response to it starting in uh, around March. And uh, here we see the global lockdown tracker. Most of the countries started mid of March with their first severe uh, lockdown measures. Responses of governments ranged from strict control on travel, social gatherings, and commercial activities. Here are some uh, uh, nice images of uh, empty spaces, uh, which also Maurice mentioned just a few minutes ago. Uh, and these were aimed at flattening the curve to keep uh, cases below the carrying capacity of the healthcare system. So there were, would be enough emergency care beds available to deal with all those uh, cases or until we achieved, which was uh, Boris Johnson's uh, strategy, some sort of herd immunity, uh, which is a sufficient large number of recovered or immune individuals to present, prevent the effective spread of the virus, which we know is not going to happen or until a vaccine is being found, which we seem to be moving, edging closer these days. The fact is that there might be several waves of the pandemic in the future with intermittent social distances with effects on the global economy. And so what's quite interesting is uh, this uh, um, World Bank blog showing the uh, number or the percentage of economies in recession and we have the highest synchronization in the last 150 years of national recessions. So more close to 100% of global e of all economies uh, have been in recession at the same time. So we are truly in a global recession to a larger extent than we were in the Great Depression in the late 20s, early 30s. On the positive side, we see emission reductions as here in, in a paper by Le Quere, uh, uh, also in Nature Climate Change, which shows that uh, for different activities in different parts of the world, we see quite significant reductions in carbon emissions. Here, for example, power industry, surface transport, 
uh, aviation, etc., or with lower levels of activi activities, and also, thankfully, in terms of carbon mitigation, lower carbon emissions. So the big questions really is: Will we see long-term structural changes, or will we bounce right back after the recession to have some sort of, as shown on the right panel, some sort of V? Uh, recovery so that we move right back to the economy of yesterday and at least that was the intention of many governments but it seems it's not going to happen so how do we actually in this paper model disruptions to global supply chains so we use a uh, uh, global uh, multi-regional input output analysis here is a uh, heat map of uh, a early MRIO from Manfred Lenzen. So it's a gigantic database that shows flows from sectors within the economy to all the other sectors, all other economies. So in our database, we used a GTAP and we had uh, explicit carbon flows for 79 countries covering more than 90% of global GDP and emissions. But we use a modified model developed. Uh, it has a, a long list of predecessors, uh, Stenge, for example, Halligate from the World Bank, who was also involved in a previous modeling effort. And of course, Maurice Hoffman, in the, the earlier presenter, was part of these activities. And so what we try to model here is to show uh, disequilibrium, so a uh, mismatch of supply and demand. And we look at specific markets, so we look at the labor market, the uh, capital and disruptions to access to capital globally, and also as mentioned in the previous talk, uh, changes to final demand as for example, in my own example, not flying, and there are lots of other uh, significant changes in consumption patterns uh, that affect the economy. So, um, we modeled 27 scenarios of different levels of strictness and duration of lockdown over several waves over the next five years. So it's a short to mid, mid, midterm uh, scenario exercise. And so we have different combinations of le length of lockdown based on a science paper by Kisler et al, who um, uh, estimated that we would be until 2024 in various degrees of lockdown and waves of lockdown. We also distinguish second uh, uh, row in terms of strictness of lockdown. We use here movement data from Google com uh, Community Mobility um, apps and third strictness uh, and we vary different levels of strictness of future lockdowns. They uh, actually decrease gradually. So what did we find uh, in terms of carbon impacts of uh, lockdown measures? So which countries and sectors are most affected? So here we see, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, uh, but you see, no, let's leave it like this. The baseline, so emissions without COVID-19 based on IMF data and the uh, YASA integrated assessment model. So we have a slight decrease over the time period in question. So that's the top line. What you also see now at the end of 2020 that uh, we have a reduction that is similar to the carbon emissions of about 2006 and then the different lines show the uh, significant reductions in carbon emissions ranging from 3.9% or 5.7 gigatons to 5.6% compared to the baseline, depending on the levels of lockdown and strictness. Uh, we see here uh, emissions decline by countries on the left, and we see that the biggest contributor in terms of saved carbon emissions is China, contributing or saving 55.5%, second 
biggest savings are then in the US, close to 10%. And in terms of sectoral on the right hand side of the right pie chart, you see that most of the savings are in the power and heating uh, production sector, transport is second with uh, almost a quarter and then iron and steel production with 12% decline in carbon emissions. The decline uh, depends of course on the structural changes in labor supply structure of the economy, uh, a country's role in global supply chains, its positions and its carbon in, uh, intensity of its sectors. And so uh, the message here really is that it's uh, you need a global uh, uh, supply chain model like MRIO to really see which countries and which sectors are uh, affected through the ripple effects uh, along global supply chains. And so here you see the composition and the size of impacts for some key economies. So let's look at our second question. So what kind of future will we potentially get here? You see a nice image of uh, New Delhi, uh, one with lots of pollution and the one on the right uh, put, uh, potential less polluting depending on the investments and choices governments are making. So we have a second set of scenarios. Uh, as, as you know, the, the stimulus packages of major economies, for example, the US invested some 12% of GDP, uh, annual GDP for uh, recovery measures, and I think they did it rather badly by sending uh, checks to everybody rather than using it wisely to invest in green infrastructure. But that's an ongoing discussion with uh, Congress, for example. So what we have here in terms of uh, scenario settings, what we included was the size of the fiscal stimuli and uh, second structure of fiscal stimuli, so which sectors are potentially affected. So we look at the uh, actual uh, policies of governments as well as potential ones. And then we have assumptions, oops, to quick on sectoral emission intensity. So the baseline is, or the stated policy scenario, uh, again, is what governments have planned versus a sustainable development scenario uh, which is our best case, and then an extreme scenario, the carbon intensive scenario, and I'll come back to that later. So here you see uh, some outcomes of potential scenarios. You see the baseline again that I mentioned before, which would have a slight increase without COVID. Then we have the COVID measures bumping us back to 2006, which is fantastic. And then we see the range of potential outcomes dependent on the responses of the governments. So it's really all in their hands. So we see either a, a prolonged reduction of carbon emissions to why, despite um, rebooting the economy and the top line shows an extreme uh, increase in carbon emissions if governments would spend their money unwisely on uh, existing carbon intensive infrastructure. So here we have our three extreme scenarios. Uh, uh, so we did many more and you see the left one is the stated uh, policy scenario. So that's like a most uh, likely case with 0.7% increase due to uh, government investments. The middle scenario shows a, a reduction of close to 5%. Five, uh, 5%. This is our green scenario where uh, we assume that governments spend on green infrastructure, green energy sources, et cetera, versus then the worst case scenario, governments uh, spending on carbon intensive infrastructure, creating future lock-in, uh, leading to a 16.4% increase in carbon emissions, at least for the next uh, five years or so. So how realistic is this stuff? Our scenario, so I just looked at the energy policy tracker that uh, tracks uh, uh, policies in terms of uh, energy policies of major economies. So here, this is an example of the G20, which is investing trillions of dollars on restarting the economy of yesterday, unfortunately, I have to say. 
and you see that 53% of intended energy policies are fossil fuel based versus only a third is based on clean energy on the left. You see the different countries and their breakdown in terms of intended policies. The US with more than 50% uh, investments on fossil fuel infrastructure. China is doing actually quite well if you look at the fifth bar uh, with uh, a relatively small uh, percentage on energy, fossil fuel based energy infrastructure um, and potentially lots of clean conditional um, energy. So let me summarize um, this paper. We developed and further developed a global model that accounts for embodied or virtual carbon flows within and between countries. We quantified the potential carbon savings due to lockdown ranging between 3.9 and 5.6 percent for the 2022-2024 time period. We also showed that the fiscal measures, uh, the trillions of dollars spent, could indeed help with the energy transition to achieve climate goals, but it could also, and it looks likely, lock us further into carbon-intensive pathways, wasting trillions of dollars uh, that will not be available for investing in the required low carbon infrastructure. So really the, the conclusion is that this crisis is a terrible thing to waste, a terrible opportunity we're wasting here. And so I thank you very much with these thoughts. Thank you very much. I think it gives some food for thoughts also for questions. Um, we will 